Hello and welcome to episode 89 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I'm one of the co-founders here at ETR. We are entering peak fantasy football drafting season. Time to get very serious. So, of course, I'm joined by Evan Silva, the lord of your top 150 rankings. Evan, what's going on? What's going on? Adam, you know, I learned something this week. And I learned that the Leonard Fournette Hive is <laughs> alive and well. Uh, because we put out a little clip of, you know, our, our spiel on Leonard Fournette uh, from, the East, from the ETR Twitter account. And boy, that, that really got um, that generated a lot of interest in the fantasy community. I mean, any time that you can draft a, a highly inefficient running back on the worst team in the league that his own team tried to trade him and no one would give up a, a sack of punctured footballs for, um, you, you, you got to do that within the first three rounds of your fantasy draft. Uh, you realize you stoked the flames of the Leonard Fournette Hive by saying that I believe the quote was, you know who the worst person is in your fantasy football league if they take Leonard Fournette in the third round. Like, you didn't just retweet it. You went totally ham and said basically you're a total donkey if you take Leonard Fournette in the third yeah, round. Yeah, I mean, look, you gotta, you got to throw out a little, little fire, a little spice every now and again. And plus, I know that uh, Matt Kelly, you know, fr- good friend of the show, Matt Kelly, he is pro Leonard Fournette this year. And I'm going on his podcast in a couple of weeks, and I can't wait to chop it up with him. We usually agree on, on really the vast majority of takes, but we're, we're at opposite, opposite ends of the spectrum this year on Leonard Fournette, and that's okay. That's what makes this stuff fun. Yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> it's funny to me. Like, Leonard Fournette, um, and we don't have to get into it all again, but people just assume all touches are worth the same amount. Like, Leonard Fournette touch is worth so, so little compared to uh, other backs. And then also – more importantly, I think you throw into what you said about them trying to get rid of the guy. I, I mean, you know, so well, you know, we've made it, we've maybe overestimated at this point the likelihood of him getting cut. It's maybe be like five percent now, but even that five percent to me is still like enough to make yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, no, no, you know, no, none of the other top fifteen backs are are you know at threat at r- any sort of risk of of right. you know ending up on another team or ending up not on a team by you know week three or, I mean. You know, he, he's ruffled feathers within the Jaguar, Jaguars organization. Um, again, they try to get rid of him. No, t- no teams wanted him. So, I mean, that should tell you what you need to know about where, Jen- where Leonard Fournette is at this stage of his career in terms of his on-field production. Yeah, and, and among players who are most likely to show up from this corona break out of shape and not in the best shape, I think Leonard Fournette would probably be among the favorites if there was a betting market. Uh, have, anyway. you see, have you seen any Leonard Fournette workout videos? Or <laughs> I haven't. No, only like Austin Eckler and like A.J. Brown. And James Conner. Yeah. Um, okay, anyways, enough Leonard Fournette. Uh, we're going to talk today about the fallout from the Darius Geis release. We're going to talk about some more opt-outs. We're going to talk about news out of training camp. We're going to talk about optimal draft position. Before that, wanted to remind everyone that we've been working incredibly hard on our draft kit to make sure it literally has everything you could possibly need for your specific draft. It's continuously updated daily, all the rankings and everything. It's just $34.99. Comes with a $25 coupon to use in any FFPC league. So basically, Evan, you get it for $10. You go on and you win your FFPC league by not taking Leonard Fournette, and it's a total print fest. So uh, easy decision there. Okay, let's get to the task at hand. Ugly situation for Darius Geis, at least the allegations, what he was charged with is extremely ugly. The Washington football team made the decision to immediately move on from Darius Geis and release him at that moment the Antonio Gibson hype train has spiraled in my opinion has spiraled completely completely out of control okay (laughs) maybe I should let you go first because I I have some takes on on Antonio Gibson you gave Antonio Gibson a very 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 big bump in your rankings obviously he was low but you gave him a very very big rankings why don't you just give the people an overview before we get into it of what you think of Antonio Gibson right now as we stand here on August 11th so, I mean, I've been intrigued by Ant- Antonio Gibson ever since I learned that he was an actual thing coming out um, of Memphis, where, of course, Daryl Henderson and Tony Pollard also went. They just, they're producing like, you know, big time athletic running backs at, at Memphis at a clip where they couldn't even get Antonio Gibson the ball. He had 77 offensive touches in two seasons. He did uh, play special teams when he got the ball. He was incredibly dynamic. Of course, he, you know, he, he tests like a, a complete freak. Uh, before the draft and but I still thought that because he um, had received so little um, 
so, so, so few touches in, in college that teams would be cautious about him, and he'd probably be like a fifth or sixth round flyer. Well, he goes at the top of the third round to the Redskins, who really are bereft of playmakers. One of those playmakers that they were counting on would, was Darius Geis, who did a horrible thing to a woman, got his ass cut, and that freed up a, a, a pathway of touches to a number of other backs. Now, their, their backfield is still very deep. Uh, Adrian Peterson, uh, Bryce Love is coming back from a redshirt season. They even have Peyton Barber and J.D. McKissick, who have played snaps in the NFL. But you know, we, we have it on good word that Antonio Gibson, that, that their new OC, Scott Turner, is, an absolute, is absolutely in love with Antonio Gibson. Uh, I think he's going to get carries. I think he's going to get catches. And uh, before, I, I, there just was not a clear pathway for him to touches. And now there is. Now, we, I, I did put him in a very aggressive spot. I put him as a top 80 player, number 78 overall. But he's still the RB32. And these are the sort of players that he's around. I put him right ahead of Marvin Jones, okay, who, I mean, I like Marvin Jones plenty. Uh, I don't want him as my wide receiver three. I'd love him as my wide receiver four. Um, Jalen Rieger, Henry Ruggs, Brandon Ayuk, that little tier of, you know, very, very intriguing, high upside rookie first round wide receivers in a year where, you know, they're going to get, what, 10 padded practices or, or something like that. John Brown, and then we're looking at quarterbacks and Tevin Coleman and, you know, RB3 slash fours, carry on Johnson. So that's where I put him. And, I, you know, when you – I understand that that seems really early uh, within the top 80 overall players, but when you put it in context of the guys that you would be drafting around him, you know, I, I think that he does not have a safe floor. So a bunch of those guys have a safe floor. John Brown has a safe floor. I think, you know, even Jalen Rieger, Henry Ruggs, the, Marvin Jones, those guys have safe floors, but Antonio Gibson, um, if he can get into a, a situation where he's catching four, five, six balls a game, getting six, seven, eight carries per game, um, I think he, you know, he, he's going to be an upside flex play in an offense that is otherwise beyond Terry McLaurin, really just bereft of playmakers. Yeah. So here's my concern. And I've seen people take uh, Antonio Gibson since this news as high as the fifth round. I've seen him go in the sixth round. I've seen him go a lot in the seventh round as well. Uh, awesome prospect profile, right? Like forget about the college production. Six, oh, six feet flat, 228, ran a 439. And a running back who played slot receiver, in college is like exactly what I'm looking for. Like I am looking for guys who can play the Christian McCaffrey, the Alvin Kamara type role. Not obviously I don't think Antonio Gibson is going to have the same impact as those guys, at least in year one or ever, but playing that same role where you can get six, seven, eight, nine carries a game and three, four, five targets a game. Okay. Now we're cooking a little bit. However, we still have the league's 30th ranked offensive line per Brandon Thorne. Only the Bengals and the Dolphins are worse. According to Brandon, we still have Adrian Peterson, who uh, Evan mentioned, we still have Bryce Love, we still have Peyton Barber, we still have J.D. McKissage, and we have a guy who touched the ball 77 times in college. And so to ask him in this offseason to come in and have a huge impact right away, I think is asking a lot. Now, I think that, man, anybody who gets three, four, five targets and six, seven, eight carries, you know, and if that you think that's a reasonable projection, like I think it's fine to take him ahead of Marvin Jones. I think it's fine to take him ahead of Jalen Reaver, specifically uh, only exclusively because he has – running back eligibility and he's going to be playing a lot of wide receiver which I think he will I mean look at their depth chart we know they lost Kevin Har Kelvin Harmon we've talked about Antonio Gandy Gibson on here we've talked about Steven Sims on here you can make a case that Antonio Gibson actually could be better than them those guys as a wide receiver right away so I don't want to let the hype get away from me I understand though because of the prospect profile running backs who can catch passes and runs routes like this is just so 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 exciting to me so yeah I would probably pass fifth sixth Seventh round, I would start considering Antonio Gibson probably in the eighth round. And I'll be looking for more news on terms of who he's running with in training camp. But that news is really hard to come by these days. So, yeah, um, I'm probably a little yeah. bit lower than you are, Evan. But, but I get the upside take on Antonio Gibson. Yeah, I, I, I bet you're actually not, not that much lower on, on him than me. Like if we did a draft together, I think that yeah. I, mean, I, I just took him in the seventh round in a draft. And then J.J. took him. Uh, JJ at late round QB, JJ Zacharias, and just took him in the eighth round in the Apex League. Yeah. So, I, and I think that, that those are very reasonable areas to take Antonio Gibson, not taking him in the fifth, almost certainly not taking him in the sixth. But I think that in the seventh round, you know, when, when you ha already have six position players, I mean, that's the time to just 
sort of, you know, cook out the floor and just start chasing ceilings. Yeah. I guess I might also be scarred by some like organizational dysfunction. Like I, you know, I like Terry McLaurin, but it still scares me that the Reds that I'm sorry, the Washington football team is, ha, is and has been so inept for so long an organizational basis that they're just going to screw what up whatever talent that they have. But, um, you know, interesting story for sure. All right, let's get to Jarvis Landry. We've talked about Jarvis Landry briefly a couple of times on here, mainly in the context of we didn't know if he would be healthy. Good sign for Jarvis Landry, you know, August uh, 8th, and he was already removed from PUP off that hip surgery. Um, I think that we both are higher on Jarvis Landry than maybe the market by at least a little bit. They're going to run a ton of 12. That doesn't bother me that much because unlike, say, Arizona or other teams, like the concentration of targets between Odell and Jarvis Landry should be really strong. Jarvis Landry has never had fewer than 81 catches in a season in his career. Also never missed a game in his career. And also last year, I thought, showed more of an ability to get downfield, career high 14.1 yards per catch. So I, I think this news that he's off pup already is really good for Jarvis Landry. Did you move him up at all? Had you moved him down? And where are you at on Jarvis Landry right now? No, we've held steady. He's been the wide receiver 31 for like uh, probably months at this point, at, at least several weeks. Um, didn't We did not move him when he went when he opened camp on PUP, and then he was like cleared within the first – week uh so we're expecting a, a full full you know uh, fully healthy Jarvis Landry to open the season he was the wide receiver 14 overall last year in PPR um and we are ahead of him uh uh versus consensus right now having him as the wide receiver 31 um so yeah we're, we're gonna stay ahead of him we, we realize that the Browns are not gonna have a ton of pass volume probably this year, but we do expect him to be efficient. Here. And I think that's a great point. Yeah, his A dot uh, was significantly higher. They used him like as a running back almost uh, in Miami. His A dot was significantly higher. He was running true uh, wide receiver routes uh, this past year in Cleveland. We understand that there's a new coaching staff there, but I think they're a smart coaching staff. And he's going to be that, that primary low read. Odell Beckham will be the high read on the play action. Jarvis Landry will be the low, lower read. Um, and, I, and he's also going to run some intermediate to deeper routes, too. He's, he's a really good football player. Yeah. Okay. This Miami situation is getting interesting. Alan Hearns and Albert Wilson both opted out. And also, you know, I like Preston Williams, man, but coming off the ACL tear and Miami said, well, we're hopeful he'll be ready for week one. You know, nobody's saying Preston Williams is definitely going to be ready. So we'll see on that. They're getting really thin. I mean, they have Devontae Parker, obviously. They have Mike Jasicki, who I want to talk about in a second. But behind that, I don't even know, like – Jakeem Grant, uh, Isaiah Ford. Uh, if Preston Williams can't play, how do you see Miami's wide receiver depth chart shaking out come week one? Uh, that's if Preston Williams can't play? Yeah. Yeah, I think that they would run um, probably a lot of two tight end sets with Mike Tosicki and Durham Smythe, uh, who's more of the blocker there, um, and then use Isaiah Ford and Jakeem Grant as the depth receivers behind Devontae Parker. I think that if they're going to play a lot of spread, which again is, is, you know, a lot, it makes up a lot of Chan Gailey's history. Um, then Preston Williams and Devontae Parker will be the outside receivers. Isaiah Ford and Jakeem Grant will be the interior receivers, but I gave Mike Jasicki a pretty significant bump. Oh yes. From tight end 15 to uh, up to tight end 11. I believe he did advance a tier um, or at least he came really close to it. And um, he's now a guy that's very much in range for us to draft. I was, I, I've been down on the Dolphins offense. I mean, they're changing OCs. They're changing their offensive system. Um, they have, you know, potential or very likely, high likelihood of in-season quarterback controversy. Brandon has, has them as the worst offensive line in the league. So I think there's going to be some really bad weeks for the Dolphins offense along the way. And this is generally not one that I want to invest in heavily but, you know, I, I could, I, I'm, st I'm starting to see the light, I think, with Mike Jacecki, uh, which was cleared significantly by Albert Wilson and Alan Hearns, who both play slot receiver. And Jacecki had one of the highest slot rates among tight ends this past season. So, uh, you know, there's definitely a scenario where that just the, – the, the, the person that's going to benefit from those opt-outs is just going to straight up be Mike Jacecki. Um, and we don't want to be late for that dance. Oh, you're getting me fully aroused now because Mike Jasicki, another Penn State guy, and I've talked about him. Evans tried to talk me off the ledge on him. But, man, if you don't ask 
if you have a good coaching staff, and I think Chan Gailey is pretty sharp, you don't ask Mike Jasicki to line up in line. You don't ask him to be physical. You turn Mike Jasicki into a slot receiver, essentially. And they figured it out. The previous offense corner over the set final seven games last year, Mike Jasicki played 76% of the snaps. 78% of those snaps, he was slot or wide. Averaged 7.8 targets, scored five touchdowns. Miami took zero wide receivers or tight ends in the draft. Now they get the Hearns and the Wilson opt-out. Now we don't know if Preston Williams is going to be healthy. It's lining up really well for Mike Jasicki. Um, I was a bit concerned. I-, I tweeted out, I don't know if you saw it, Evan, Michael Lombardi, who was pretty plugged in, uh, gave his predictions for the big quarterback controversies. Obviously, he said Cam is a no-brainer to start uh, in week one. The one that concerned me a little bit was he was like, yeah, you know, they were likely to get Tua in there around week four, five, six. And as I've said before, I think Ryan Fitzpatrick is just like the rainmaker for fantasy wide receivers and pass catchers. Such a high turnover rate, uh, turns into shootouts often. And I'm not sure that's going to be the case with Tua. But uh, still, I I like Mike Jasicki. I think his ADP has come down a bit uh, from where it was. But obviously, uh, really good talent. And and Here's the thing with, you know, making predictions uh, regarding uh, rookie quarterback insertion, uh, in this particular year and trying to use historical precedents for that. I mean, typically that, that rookie quarterback is going to play a bunch in the preseason. He's going to get a ton of reps in training camp. There's no preseason here th- this year. There's what, you know, some, some 14, 14 days yeah. of, of padded practices, which doesn't necessarily mean, necessarily mean 14 padded practices. That could mean eight to 10 or 12. I mean, they're not going to do it every single day. Um, and then the, the lights shut off for the backup quarterbacks during the regular season. I mean, the, the, the only guy who gets first team reps during the regular season is the starting quarterback. The, the, the backup quarterbacks are what coaches talk about this all the time. The backup quarterbacks do not get reps. They might get like literally three reps in a practice. Um, and, and that, and that might be even be generous. Yeah. So it's, you know, once the season starts, it's going to take like an unraveling, like losses, losses for the team to turn to the rookie quarterback that's why I think that Tyrod might because I think the Chargers are going to be decent enough their schedule is decent enough early in the season I think that Tyrod is going to keep that job longer than expected now the Dolphins do have a pretty tough schedule um, so that's not that's going to work against Ryan Fitzpatrick but I think that's what it's going to take it's not going to be like oh you know it's time to turn the the keys over to, to Tua. He's ready. He's been showing us in practice. He's not going to be showing anything in practice. Right. Ryan Fitzpatrick's going to be getting all the reps. There's going to need to be like an avalanche of losses for the rookie quarterback to go in. Yeah, that's certainly possible, right? And Mike Lombardi uh, did say, to your point, that he expects Tyrod Taylor to hold the job for most of the year, if not all of it. So, um, yeah, I think you guys are on the same page there. And, and I'd agree that Tyrod, you know, the longer Tyrod can hold the job, um, he's going to be fantasy viable thanks to rushing ability and yes, really good is. weaponry. Uh, okay. Got a good quote for our boy, Ian Thomas. A uh, quote from Matt Rule uh, comes out and says, yeah, Chris Manhurts is going to be our blocking tight end. He's one of the best blocking tight ends in the league, but it's quote unquote, Ian Thomas's turn. Um, you know, they're not making Ian Thomas compete for this role and, and nobody thought that he would, but it's just good to hear Matt Rule come in and say it. They're just handing Ian Thomas the full blown, uh, passing tight end role. Uh, you have him as the tight end 15, just behind Hunter Henry, Noah Fant, Dallas Goddard, just ahead of TJ Hawkinson. You know, I've said a million times that I really do like this tier. And particularly in Best Buy, I like taking three out of this tier rather than spending a lot of draft capital. But one of the top guys, I'm not sure that's the correct take or not, but I really am high on this tier. Anything change on your Ian Thomas take? And uh, do you have a favorite in this tier at all between the Hunter Henry, Fant, Goddard, Hawkinson, Ian Thomas? No, I kind of actually like them all. And this is the tier where, you know, again, don't like drafting the, the Tyler Higbees. Don't love drafting Gronk. Don't lo- even love drafting Darren Waller or Evan Ingram. If I'm, if I'm not going to get one of the top four guys, and that extends to Andrews and Ertz, I, I always like my team when I'm done drafting better when I have waited to take like one or two guys in this tier and then maybe one or two guys in the next tier of tight ends. Always like the, the, the construction of my team better um, when I'm going elite at tight end or when I'm really, you know, scratching the, scratching the, the mid-range tight end twos. Uh, and I, I, I think there's no question that a couple of these guys are going to break out. Hopefully we're on the right ones. They're all kind of bunched together in this tier. Hayden Hurst, um, Mike Jacecki uh, is at the top of the tier. Uh, Ian Thomas a little bit lower. Hawkinson could ab- absolutely break out. Noah Fant had one of the, 
the most Im impressive, just from a, a combined yardage standpoint, one of the most impressive rookie uh, tight end seasons of the last decade. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I really like this tier. Yeah. Um, by the way, we do have – we're not going to talk about it today because we're so far from the DFS season, but we do have pricing out on both DraftKings uh, and FanDuel. And, um, yeah, I saw Ian Thomas's price, and I believe he's 3400 on DraftKings. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, that gets me uh, excited to uh, kind of punt a little bit at tight end and have more money to spend elsewhere. But it's a conversation for another day. We're a long way from DFS season, about, about a month from the first main slate. Um, Corey Davis news. And we had some – some inkling that Corey Davis was playing hurt last year. Um, I believe Taylor Luan had mentioned it on a show or something, but it wasn't really public. And now we come to find out that Corey Davis is actually coming off what sounds like toe surgery. I believe it was toe surgery. Says he's going to be fine. Still a concern, particularly considering their depth at the position. I mean, obviously they have A.J. Brown. They have Adam Humphreys in the slot. But behind that, I don't even know what they have. You know, Khalif Raymond, uh, Rashard Davis. I don't even know. So I do think Corey Davis will probably be back out there for week one. I just thought it was mentioning. And maybe it's a little bit of an excuse for Corey Davis. I mean, for, for a guy who had so much draft capital behind him and was such a highly touted prospect to perform the way that he has been so disappointing. I don't know if we can give him a pass with this toe thing. Uh, maybe this is more for dynasty people, Evan, because I don't even think Corey Davis is really on the radar in season long. What do you think about Corey Davis right now in light of the toe news? No, uh, Yeah, we've got him at wide receiver 75. I think that he's a guy that might, you know, get a change of scenery and benefit um, from that, that change of scenery, uh, you know, some, at some point down the road, but I just, I don't think it's going to happen for him in Tennessee. He's obviously been usurped by AJ uh, Brown as the number one receiver there. They're, you know, the, one of the run heaviest teams in football. We have not had him as a draftable player uh, since, you know, we, we opened up shop this year and, you know, this only, only hurts his cause. And I think it does supplement A.J. Brown to some extent. You know, A.J. Brown did what he did last year on 84 targets. Right. All we need him to, is to get like 110, 115 range. And, you know, I think that the, the, the condom is coming off for, for A.J. Brown. He's going to have some, expl some major eruptions uh, this year. Yeah. I can see A.J. Brown like getting like five targets and me not playing him and then just yeah. tilting me so bad. He's going to go oh, like yeah. four, 100. Oh, yeah. All year long. Uh, Okay, uh, I, I know we talked about this with Thorman. I just want to circle back on this Henry Ruggs slot thing again because I want to be clear on what's going on here. The quote that got circulated around the fantasy football world was Greg Olson, the OC, saying Henry Ruggs is going to be our slot receiver. Evan and Pat were rightfully skeptical about that. And then Vic Tarfor, who has been covering the Raiders for a very long time, says, hang on. What Greg Olson actually said was that Henry Ruggs will play Z and slot and they'll move him around a lot. And that's exactly what Evan and Pat anticipated would happen. And as Evan said, I think this is actually a pretty valuable role, right? The Tyreek Hill, the Deshaun Jackson, where you can play outside, you can play Z, and then you kick into the inside for some of these targets where they get you the ball and you try to get a bubble screen and you try to make space happen and stuff like that. So I still am really high on Henry Ruggs. I hope that his ADP comes back down off that little boost it got last week, but kind of as expected with Henry Ruggs, Evan. Yeah, I, th I think exactly as expected. And this is another guy we've been higher than uh, ADP on, and we're going to hopefully stay that way. Uh, he's going to be the clear number one, I think, right away for the Raiders. Hunter Renfro is still going to be the primary slot receiver, but he's not going to be a full-time player, as we talked about on that show with Thorman. They're going to play two and even some three tight end sets. I mean, they've got Darren Waller, Jason Witten, and Foster Moreau, who had a nice rookie season. Um, you know, they've got, they've got a fullback on the team. Um, I think they're going to be, you know, one of the, the teams that plays uh, the, the fewest uh, percentages of, of three receiver sets. Uh, and the two guys out there are going to be mostly Tyrell Williams and Henry Ruggs. Uh, Brian Edwards, I think, is still an excellent dynasty uh, hold and also may begin to eat into Tyrell Williams snaps as soon as this year. Um, but in, in, from a pecking order standpoint, I think it's, it's right now clear that Henry Ruggs is number one. Tyrell Williams, number two, Renfro, number three, and then Brian Edwards, number four. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to go to Marquise Brown quickly because I sent a tweet that I kind of regretted because I hate using arbitrary uh, endpoints, right? And so I used arbitrary endpoint of guys under 180 pounds. Just it's impossibly rare that they become elite fantasy players, like almost never. And there's just so many guys, you know, like I can't tell you how many times somebody has told me that some small yet fast dude is the next Deshaun Jackson or the next Tyreek Hill or, or whatever. And it happens 
so, so rarely. I mean, there's just dozens of guys. Marquise Brown played, allegedly played at 157 pounds last year. I mean, it's like crazy. Now, he says, allegedly now, he's gained 23 pounds of muscle, obviously, of course. Everybody's in the best shape of their life. But he claims he's gained 23 pounds of muscle. He's now up to 180. Um, Marquise Brown, obviously, uh, with the right amount of targets in the right situation, uh, which a lot of people think that he is, has a massive, massive ceiling. And it scares me to be out on Marquise Brown. Um, I just think my personal take on the whole thing with these small guys is the gambling graveyard is just littered with people who thought they could project outliers. And for everyone that hits, you know, Tyreek Hill or Odell Beckham rookie year or, or whatever, for every one of those that hits and I lose, everyone forgets about the other nine or 20 or 100 times they thought they had this eye for outlier talent, but they actually didn't. So uh, you guys know me. I'm not a team watch the tape guy. I understand the tape guys absolutely love Marquise Brown. I understand there's not a ton of target competition there. Um, I understand he had a screw in his foot last year. Now he doesn't. I understand he's up 23 pounds. So I can understand there's a lot pointing in his favor. We'll see, man. I still prefer Will Fuller. I'm going to go down with that ship in my bet with Dink. But yeah, any reaction to the news that Marquise Brown is allegedly up 23 pounds to 180? I mean, it's just, he's still really small. He's yeah. still a really little guy. Um, no, I mean, I don't, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't be out on Marquise Brown if I were you. You, you, can, you can prefer Will Fuller straight up and yeah. still be in on Marquise Brown. That's where I feel like I am. Um, we've got Marquise Brown, I think wide receiver 28. Will Fuller, like wide receiver 25. Um, you know, they're real close to each other. Uh, Will Fuller has, you know, done it. I, I understand he's gotten hurt a lot, but he, he's had a lot of big games in the NFL. Um, and I think he's in a little bit better offensive environment. Uh, but Marquise Brown is not in a bad offensive environment either, especially because, you know, this is another team that's going to play a lot of two receiver, two, uh, two tight end sets. And Marquise Brown is going to be one of those guys out there on the field. And, you know, they're going to score a lot of points. They're going to continue to score a lot of points. And, and he's going to be on the receiving end of, of much of that. And he's going to have spiked weeks. And um, no, I, I like be in on Marquise Brown, just like Will Fuller better. <laughs> yeah, I will say, you know, there's not a lot of opportunity cost in Marquise Brown because you can op often get him in like the seventh, maybe even sometimes the eighth round. And so obviously, like, there's a lot of upside there at that price. I just think people are going overboard saying Marquise Brown is the next top 10 wide receiver and stuff like that. That would be so unlikely to end up happening. Like really, really historically unlikely. Um, okay. We've had a bit of time to digest this Jordan Reed news. Jordan Reed signed with San Francisco. I believe it was last week or maybe the week before. Um, dude has had just this incredibly scary concussion history and has not been able to stay healthy from other perspectives as well, not just concussion. Um, I don't think there's enough volume in the offense or enough of a role for Jordan Reed to be fantasy viable, even if he does sustain health. I am maybe a little concerned, maybe like 5% concerned or something small, that he's going to run routes that George Kittle uh, would have ran, ran on some pass downs. I mean, George Kittle is such a good blocker. I already had a little bit of concerns on George Kittle's routes run per drop back. I mean, dude is just such a good blocker. I know they like using him that way. It doesn't mean I'm out on George Kittle. I still think George Kittle has passed to just an absolutely monster breakout year, particularly if San Francisco ends up throwing the ball a lot more than it did last year, which I think that they will. But do you think the Jordan Reed signing has any impact at all, even 5% on George Kittle's outlook? I'm not overthinking this with George Kittle. Um, you know, Jordan Reed signed for the stone minimum, did not play football last year. No, I mean, I, he, he could potentially be a good, like, real-life role, uh, role player signing for the 49ers, but I'm not pulling anything away from Kittle uh, for, for Jordan Reed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this Joe Mixon quote uh, from the offensive coordinator. Offensive coordinator Brian Callahan on Joe Mixon says, Joe Mixon gets better as he gets more carries. As the season went along, he's referring to last year, as the season went along, we got better getting Joe Mixon more touches. When he's touching the ball 20-plus times, the total at the end of the game means his numbers are usually pretty good, carries and catches. You know, just standard coach speak, but it's at least encouraging to hear them say that we want to get the ball to Joe Mixon a ton. We don't want to have Joe Mixon limited at the expense of Gio Bernard getting there, which we've seen in the past on some pass downs. So, uh, man, I mean, I'm, I think this offense is going to be way, way, way better. I like Joe Burrow. I even like Joe Burrow in fantasy probably more than most um, – 
I don't know. I felt a little bit better about Joe Mixon from this quote. And like some of this coach speak stuff, I try my hardest not to let it like get into me, but like the Miles Sanders stuff, which we're going to talk about in a second and the Joe Mixon stuff, it just kind of makes me feel a little bit warmer. what do you think of the Joe Mixon quote from Brian Callahan? Well, it is not just coach speak because they actually followed through on this halfway through the, in, in that article, which was from bangles.com. They talked about how the offensive staff like tore up their previous running game and went with a completely new philosophy halfway through last year. And over the last eight games, Joe Mixon led the NFL in carries. Mm -hmm. And only Derrick Henry had more rushing yards in the second half of the year. So it's not just coach, coach speak. I mean, this is something that was actually implemented. They clearly believe. And Joe Mixon is going to be the centerpiece of their offense. Joe Mixon is like my highest owned running back. I did not plan this. But Joe Mixon is like my highest owned running back uh, so far at this stage of – uh, I just got him in the Apex League and like at 203 after yeah, getting Miles crazy. Sanders yeah. after getting Miles Sanders as my um as my my RB1 um but and I I did not draw it up this way you know I, I still don't like to invest super heavily in in running backs on teams that I don't think are going to be particularly good I do think that the Bengals have a chance to win like 6 or 7 you know they're not going to be like the Jaguars who are like almost actively tanking mm -hmm. um you know, and, and I think that Joe Mixon is, is a, I mean, he's a badass running back. I mean, he's got 17 touchdowns and almost 3,000 yards from scrimmage over the past two years playing in, you know, one of the worst offensive environments that you can draw up. And now the offensive environment is getting better. Uh, Pat, Thurm, Pat Thorman talked about how he expects the Bengals to play at one of the crispest paces this year. They, they played pretty fast last year. I think they were top six or seven in offensive plays. Um, you know, Mixon ha has that, that contract year narrative working for him. Um, and I, I just – I think they're going to score more points uh, as an offense, and they're going to give him the ball a, just a ton of times, um, you know, based on what they did in the second half of last year and what the, the coaching staff is saying. You know, like, people try to compare the situation to the Leonard Fournette situation, and it, it's totally different. I mean, you know, th this is a team that is going to be actively trying to win um, – you know, is actually has uh, discussed a contract extension with Joe Mixon. You know, like the Jaguars declined Leonard Fournette's uh, 2021 option, tried to trade him. You know, who knows where he's going to be, you know, by week three. Joe Mixon is going to be on the Bengals getting, you know, almost 30 touches a game at that point. Um, 30 touches is probably an, an, an overreaction. But, you know, he's going to have 30 touch games this year. And, um, uh, you know, I'm generally excited to draft him. I, I wish his team was better. Uh, but I absolutely believe in his talent, in his versatility, um, and, and the, the, the growth of the situation. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about draft position in a second, but I think Joe Mixon and Miles Sanders and these guys, you know, being high on these guys is the key to wanting one of those 1.8, 1.9, uh, 1.10 draft picks. And for you to get Joe Mixon at 2.3, I don't even know. I'd have to look at the board to see that, how that happened, but that sounds completely ridiculous. Uh, well, it's because a couple of guys are like going zero RB. And, right, uh, like DeAndre Hopkins went in front of him. Right. So that'll push him down to you. Yeah. Well, we know how you feel about that. Um, okay. Miles Sanders versus Joe Mixon. I think you made a switch here recently in the top 150. And we just talked about how much you love Joe Mixon. But there's some quotes coming out of Philly, too, similar to Joe Mixon. I mean, the quotes from Deuce Staley and this coaching staff, it's Miles Sanders' backfield. There's no more committee. He can handle it all. We want to give him as many touches as possible. And their actions have said that. I mean, they had chances to try to get Carlos Hyde. Uh, they, had, they could have gotten Lamar Miller, who just signed. We'll talk about in a second with uh, the Patriots. Like, they could have gotten these guys for cheap. They didn't. And they, now they said they don't want to spend more than the veteran minimum. I don't know if there's anybody left that's going to take that. Will Devontae Freeman take the veteran minimum? I don't know. Either way, it's really pointing towards Miles Sanders being the actual guy and them ditching this committee approach that they've wanted to use for so long. So I think there's many people on the clock who are considering Miles Sanders or Joe Mixon on their draft. What would you tell the people to do? If they're on the clock there, Sanders versus Mixon. I prefer Sanders, but they're right next to each other. Um, I think that the takeaway from all this is just, that, you know, this the coaching narrative with Doug Peterson is just a bunch of BS. Uh, leading into this season, the leading rusher for the Eagles under Doug Peterson is Wendell Smallwood. Okay? So it's not like, oh, Doug Peterson, you know, all he wants is RBBC. You know, he didn't have a back worth featuring. He had Wendell Smallwood leading his team in, in rushing over, you know, like a four-year span. So always take the coaching narratives with a major, major grain of salt. 
Um, certainly coaching impacts uh, what happens on the field more so than, than any, any sport uh, in the NFL. But still, the, the coaching narratives that, that people uh, build up off of very small samples and very, very noisy samples are very, very dangerous. And de they were detrimental last year to people that were, you know, riding that narrative and unwilling to take Miles Sanders in the sixth round. You remember, we were just smashing the button every time. Miles Sanders in the sixth round. He was, you know, and he was a league winner by the end of the season. Um, but people wouldn't take him in the sixth round because they believe this crazy narrative that Doug Peterson would never feature a running back. I mean, you know, just, just be, be very wary of things like that. Yeah. To be fair, he was playing behind Jordan Howard. But I think by the end of the year, regardless. He was sharing Miles time with Jordan Howard, yeah, yeah. which we anticipated. Right. But, I mean, you know, we, we expected him to, to start kind of slow, which he did. Yeah. And then, you know, he catches a break and boom, he takes off. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I think Jordan Howard is better and coaches like him more than obviously anybody that Eagles have right now or the Eagles could sign. So yeah, I, you know, all these, these teams that start, like that team that you started in Apex with Sanders and Mixon is just so good. We'll talk about that more in a second. I want to quickly mention Deshaun Jackson because you gave him a big boost in your top 150. Tell the people why Deshaun Jackson has moved up so much. Because I think that after the anti-Semitism thing uh it looked like he could get cut mm -hmm. but now it looks like the eagles are going to you know s sort of like you know teach him you know he he's gonna have to learn you know b better to, to think uh you know in a better way I, you know yeah <laughs> this is not my is area, too, area of expertise no, but the, it the, looks like he's gonna be an eagle in, in week one yeah least. he's too he's too valuable to the team to be cut let's be honest but go ahead yeah, no, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I mean, and especially like after Marquise Goodwin opted out, Alshon Jeffrey, it looks like he's going to open the season on reserve PUP. Yeah. I mean, I think the Eagles week one starters at wideout are going to be Deshaun Jackson and um, Jalen Rieger. Uh, it might be J.J. Arcega-Whiteside, but I think that uh, Jalen Rieger ends up just playing more snaps anyway. Um, you know, but yeah, I think that Deshaun Jackson is like going to start week one now. Yeah, uh, me and Leone did a uh, underdog uh, live stream, and we ended up with a Carson Wentz, Deshaun Jackson, uh, Jalen Rieger, and we threw in J.J. Arcega Whiteside late on that wow. team. And so, uh, yeah, I think all those guys can be had for values, and Deshaun Jackson for sure. All right, last bit of news here we're going to get to is Lamar Miller signing with the New England Patriots. Um, Lamar Miller obviously coming off of an ACL and MCL tear, 29 years old. I don't think he has a big impact, but maybe it's a sign that they're a little bit worried about Sony Michelle's injuries. Um, maybe they just need another camp body because Sony may not be ready to play and Brandon Bolden is not really a running back. And so they don't want to put too much on Damian Harris in camp. I don't know, but what was your reaction to Lamar Miller signing with the Patriots? Um, you know, I put Lamar Miller in the tiers, but he's not even anywhere close to the top 150. I suppose that could change at some point, but I, I sort of doubt it. I moved down Michelle and Damian Harris a little bit just so that they're behind DeAndre Washington and Adrian Peterson. Um, I don't want any part of Sony Michelle. That, that has been the case for, for months. I have not even come close to drafting him. I have drafted a decent amount of Damian Harris. I actually have Damian Harris now ahead of Sony Michelle. Um, but that's really the only Patriots running back. I mean, I, I guess I, I take James White in a certain scenario, in a certain team build. Uh, but he just doesn't offer enough upside. I think that Damian Harris is, is the Patriots running back that I'm willing to draft late. And hopefully this brings down – because his ADP was starting to get like early double-digit rounds. I like it when you can get him like 12th, 13th, 14th mm -hmm. round, and hopefully the Lamar Miller signing pu pushes Damian Harris back into that range. But, yeah, this is, this is one of those years where um, I'm kind of out on the Patriots back. There. I've been in, in on it for, for the last five years, and that's been actually – really profitable with like the LeGarrette Blunt year and you know Rex Burkhead has had stretches and James White had a big year mixed in there and um, you know it, it, it has been profitable because people don't want to because people are afraid of the RBBC and then they allow those guys to really plummet um, yeah. you know in, in terms of their ADP and they, they become cheap uh, with a lot of upside but this year I just there, there's a lot of guys there and um, Damian Harris is really the only guy that I'm willing to take a shot on right now. Yeah, ambiguous backfields to me are always going to be more valuable than um, it seems. You know what I mean? Just people don't know. They get paralyzed. And the next thing you know, you get guys, you know, like, uh, who knows, Marlon Mack or 
or uh, Damian Harris in the double digit rounds. The one thing I'll say about James White, we haven't talked a lot about James White. I just want to bring it up because we had a bit of a, an argument in Slack uh, over James White. I mean, it's really hard to use historical passing rates to running backs from New England's offense when you're switching quarterbacks. Like Tom Brady is so much more likely to throw to James White than Cam Newton was. It's just hard because baseline rates with, with James White, you know, are going to scale back to Tom Brady. So, um, you know, I, I, I agree with you that I'm probably not taking James White. It's more because I'm just skeptical on Cam Newton. And also he's just so much less likely to throw to, to running backs, I think. But yeah, I know there's some people who still like James White as like a ninth or 10th round pick. All right. Before we get out of here. Yeah, no, that, that's where we have James White too, is like a, a eighth, ninth, 10th round pick. So we're, we're right about in line with ADP on James White. Um, okay, before we get out of here, we get asked all the time, probably like three, four, five times a week, somebody tweets at us, where, if I could choose my draft slot, where should I choose? And I actually think I had a bad take earlier, and I wanted to rectify that. Early in the season, I thought that there was like a tier drop off after Christian McCaffrey, Ezekiel Elliott, uh, and, and Saquon Barkley as like true three down plus goal line backs. And while I still think that's the case, the kind of hole that you get to when you have like specifically 1.2 and 1.3, that hole that you have when you get back where you're like forced into reaching for, I mean, I wouldn't do it, but reaching for Chris Godwin, or in my opinion, reaching for Aaron Jones or taking, you know, Patrick Mahomes or Lamar Jackson. Like it's just such a tough spot there. I really prefer to try to get to the back end and then you can get these starts like Miles Mixon, like Derrick Henry, Kenyon Drake like Mixon and Josh Jacobs, if you like him, but just one of those RB, RB starts that sets you up to just absolutely ravage in rounds three through seven with absurd wide receiver values. You know, the Calvin Ridley's, the Adam Thielen's, the DK Metcalf's, the Terry McLaurin's, Will Fuller, you know, Gallup, Landry, wh whatever you like. It just sets you up so much better to start at the back end with two of these running backs instead of in the back end of the second round, I feel like I'm always reaching. So right now I would say my favorite would be 1.1 just because I think Christian McCaffrey is so far and away the best. And then probably, you know, 12th pick, 11th pick, 10th pick, something back there. I think 1.2 to like 1.6 or 1.7 is really tough. I mean, I don't want to reach for Eckler or Galladay or Hopkins or Connor or Godwin. Um, so, yeah, that's my take right now. Um, I just wanted to be on the record with that before people come back and tell me that I said that one of the earlier picks was better. Where are you at with your take right now, Evan? Where would you like to draft? Yeah, I'm in lockstep with uh... – with with you and I mean I you know I, I I've been on that for a while like really I want to draft on the ends this year usually that's not the case uh, I remember Jonathan Bales did a uh, uh, like a little bit of research from high stakes drafts that drafting in the middle actually had the highest win win rate and it's you know it's only by a little bit but but still you know it, it's every little edge counts uh, but in this particular year I oh, I typically like my drafts better when I draft on one of the ends. Um, if I'm drafting really early in the, in the first round though, it, it, it sets you up to uh, pull off a, a modified zero RB or, you know, an, an, the RB anchor strategy where you're just using, you know, you, you grab your RB one right away and then you can come down and rip off like, you know, five, six pass catchers all in a row and then jump back to like the carry on Johnson, Tevin Coleman, you know, those guys to sort of, you know, tide you over at, at, at RB two. Um, but yeah, I think drafting at the top of the round uh, sets you up for that that modified zero RB RB anchor. Uh, but then at, at the back end, you, you can absolutely come out with two stud running backs uh, pa paired together. You could also uh, do a, a zero RB build, a true zero RB build uh, from the back end of the first round. There's just, you know, and people argue about strategies every year. I think the best strategy is to let your, your first and second round picks dictate how the rest of your draft is going to go. And, and your draft slot goes a, a long way uh, toward determining who your first and second round picks are going to be. Um, so just be flexible. You know, you, there's a lot of different ways to win in fantasy. You know, they, they, there's no sense in shitting all over one strategy. Um, you know, that, you, 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 there's a lot of different ways to win. For sure. Yeah. Um, obviously, the best way to win, pick the best players. And so that's what we're also trying to help you do here on top of having the right strategy. OK, that's going to do it for this episode. We're going to be back later this week with a very special unnamed guest. But I think you guys will really 
enjoy it later on in the week, maybe Monday, we're going to have Matt Harmon, wide receiver specialist on a lot to go, a lot of good ground to cover on the podcast. Be sure you're subscribed. It's of course free. So for Evan, for producer Luke, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.